Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of The Daily Stand-Up. My name's Lee Henson, president and founder of Agile Dad, and I'm so glad you could be here with me this morning. As always, let's get started. You know, today's a very special day. Today is the day where we're going to go on and do a free public webinar regarding Agile forecasting and estimation. This topic seems to be a hot point in most organizations I go in. I mean, I've heard the no estimate movement. I've heard the we only estimate certain things movement. You know, I guess I've heard just a whole bunch of dynamic different ways that people are considering how they should do estimation. What I've done is I put together a short list of some very clear guidelines, or some very clear things that are going to help you perfect your estimation and get things right. Uh, so first of all, you should never estimate using time. The truth is time-based estimates have two things in common. They're both time-based and they're both wrong. Asking different people with varying levels of experience and different tools to get the job done to agree on a time-based estimate is just flawed. It's like asking a group of painters who have different tools and different skill levels how long it's going to take to paint a room, when in actuality what you're really trying to measure is the size of the room so that you can consistently get estimates for how long it's going to take. Studies show that time-based estimates are consistently about 17% accurate. When teams and organizations abandon time-based estimates and focus on the size of the item they're uh, working on, the size of the job, they're going to find success in their estimating and forecasting. It's just a simple formula. You know, it's the equivalent of trying to go into a fine uh, clothing store and asking, hey, you know, do you have any of those 22-hour pants and a 14-hour shirt? You know, things just aren't measured that way. Uh, I think this begs the next question. Uh, you know, who's responsible for trying to get the sizing right? You know, um, what we found is if you treat this like meteorology, you know, you only have to be right a certain percent of the time to still be successful. But when it comes to sizing and forecasting, initial sizing of backlog items should be conducted by the product owner. And I know that sounds crazy, but this is a good practice because then it allows the product owner to make certain that they have their head around the size and scope of the story. And they should have some assistance, maybe from someone on a team, maybe a lead developer or an architect or a technical analyst. Uh, this will allow for a better comparison later between what the product owner initially thinks the size and scope of the item is versus what the team feels the size and scope of the item is. This estimate gets resolved later at rapid release planning where the team presents their size estimate uh, in the blind. In other words, they don't see the initial estimate of the product owner. We don't want that to skew their ability to give a good estimate. The estimate can be further validated in product backlog refinement where the product owner meets with the team for you know, uh, an hour a week. So there's lots of opportunities to get this estimate right. So I don't want you to think that the initial size is an end-all be-all, but the, uh, the initial estimate should be placed on by a product owner, followed by the team with their estimation practices. You know, the toughest conversation that I probably have with leadership and others is what is a story point and why does it matter? Why is it useful to you? For years, people continue to try to associate a story point with either time or cost and the number of people used to get the job done. These associations have, in fact, made story points confusing and have led to organizations trying to tie a point back to a specific metric. The truth is, although many associate a number with points, that number is nothing more than a size. Think about it like a shoe size. If someone asked you what size your shoe was, and let's just say hypothetically your shoe was a size 9, that doesn't mean it took 9 days to make the shoe, or that 9 people assembled the shoe, or even that you know, it cost $9 each or $18 a pair, that number is just a size, and it's indicative of an approximate size that's associated with the size of your foot. It doesn't measure inches. It doesn't measure feet. Yeah, well, well, I guess technically it does measure feet, but that's, that's a whole different story, right? This is useful so that as an organization you can achieve a baseline and eventually become predictable. So when you're using points, points should be a number... Or I, I, let's just start with a size. I even use a t-shirt size in most cases that can then be affiliated back to a number. And the number is indicative of nothing other than a size. I guess the shoe size really is the easiest way to think about it. But I know what you're asking. That's great. So i got a whole closet full of shoes, but how does that tell me how long something's going to take, right? You might have a closet full of shoes, but how can you forecast without using time? How can you become predictable? The truth is, if you consider story points as only a size and allow teams to establish a baseline for what they consider small together, 
You can leverage past sprint performances of the teams or past similar projects to determine a quota called team velocity. Now I want to be careful. Team velocity should never be used as a measuring stick between teams or it should never be used as a measuring stick for performance. Team velocity simply indicates the number of units a team can complete during any given work sprint. We can then leverage that velocity to become predictable, to predict the amount of work that can be completed over time. This should never, ever, 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 are we getting back together? Oh wait, no, that's a Taylor Swift song. Never, ever, ever should it be reversed or reverse engineered to try to lock down a time estimate that's associated with points. I don't ever want to hear someone say that a point equals eight hours or a point equals six hours. That's like saying a shoe equals six hours. It, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. I think it's important for us to recognize the difference between the two and make sure that we have the right association or affiliation. When you do estimation in this manner, you can actually achieve up to 88% estimation accuracy. Because I'm a man of humility, I say 85%. There are prerequisites, however, in order to achieve 85% accuracy. First, items need to be well-written and small in size. We can't keep writing mountain-sized backlog items and expect the team to break it down in sprint planning and come up with accurate estimates. If we're going to use these estimates for forecasting, the product owner needs to get used to writing well-written stories, get the help they need, and keep things small if possible. Two, the PO needs to learn to lean on the analysts that they have with them to provide assistance and clarity when creating backlog items. Analysts should include someone from the technical side of the house, someone from the business side of the house, and someone who represents the uh, best interest of the consumer. If you have these three analysts present when you create the backlog items, it's going to provide clarity and allow people to really get their head around and understand what these estimates represent. Three, teams need to have rapid release planning to benchmark a small and have multiple chances to validate estimates together in a single meeting. This meeting should be short, hour or less, to the point. You can cover hundreds of items and really get your head around the work. Four, weekly backlog refinement must take place. We must take advantage of the product owner and a team's time and leverage that one simple hour a week in order to help people get their head around what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it, and what makes the most sense. And then finally, five, time should never be used to estimate work. Did I say never? I meant never. If you use time to estimate work, you're going to be just so far off. It's just, you want to make sure you stay as far away from time when you're doing those estimates as possible. Initial estimates are an interesting concept, and this is something that's been around for quite some time. Uh, if I remember in the early days of some of the tools that were created, the version one, the rally, the tools that were created around project management in the Agile workspace, they had fields associated with initial estimate and then estimate. There were two separate fields. And many people asked, you know, why two fields? Well, the initial estimate's critical for estimation and forecasting accuracy. The initial estimate has existed for as long as I've been doing Agile. This estimate should be placed by the product owner. Now, they shouldn't do it in an ivory tower or from some silo somewhere. You know, they need to have consultation with a, with a technical analyst or with other technical folks to make sure that they have their head around a scope prior to meeting with the entire team. Uh, so after this estimate is placed there, the purpose of the estimate is to gain clarity from the product owner from their perspective of the size or scope of the work that will later be executed by the team. The initial estimate helps resolve issues between the team's understanding and what the product owner is asking for. So I think you need some clarity there. Another question that comes up often is, should we resize work if we make discovery? Up until the work enters a working sprint, it's perfectly fine to resize or adjust story estimates. Once the work is in motion, the estimates should remain the same or remain locked. This is to afford greater predictability to leadership and helps teams have a greater understanding of the importance for accurate sizing. This also helps the product owner in scoping at later times when they have work that's similar. Frequent resizing causes great confusion and breaks all models of predictability. This also causes separation from the benchmark of revealed at rapid release planning and leads to estimation deviation at the team level. So the question then becomes when does the estimate stand? When is it final? 
Well, the estimate has three points where it can be considered a standing estimate. The first is at the backlog item creation workshop where the product owner estimate stands and the item is clarified with the technical analyst. The second is when the team estimate stands at rapid release planning uh, after discussion with the PO and with other folks there in the room. And then the third time is at sprint planning and this is the final stand, the final countdown. Uh, this affords multiple opportunities to get the estimate right and uh, lock it in. So make sure you have a good understanding that the estimate is still flexible until the work is in motion. Finally, how do you explain this to leadership? You know, some of the best things that I've recognized is try using examples that show just how ineffective time-based estimates can be. I, use an, uh, I often use an example that involves a paint crew with different skill levels, and I use the shoe size as a reference. Leadership needs to have the utmost confidence in our sizing estimates, as this is what they'll be using to forecast upcoming work and projects. Once leadership understands the concept that size is a more accurate prediction than time, they can relax and start focusing on the outcome instead of constantly focusing on output. Well, I hope you found this session useful to you. As always, we thank you for being here and listening live to this podcast. Uh, invite and encourage your friends to. We're trying to get our subscription numbers up, so if you know anyone that hasn't listened to the podcast or hasn't had a chance to, this is probably a good starting point for them. This podcast or this episode is really a powerful episode filled with great information. As always, we invite you to go to AgileDad.com where you can learn more about this or many other Agile topics. And as always, stay healthy, stay well, and stay Agile. Until next time, thank you.